Hello and welcome to episode 16 of Using Your Brain for Success, the show that's all about helping you build a better life by using your brain the right way. I'm Liam Naden, and I'm glad you're here. Now, if you've listened to previous episodes of this show, you'll know that you are literally programmed for success. It's your biological purpose to survive and to thrive. And the best way you can do that is to be the best you can be physically, mentally, and emotionally, which means, of course, your strongest, healthiest, and happiest. And nature's actually provided you with all of the tools to do that, in other words, to be the best you can be, and the main instrument for that is, of course, your brain, because your brain is far and away the most powerful and complex machine known in the universe. It actually has the computing power of 500 trillion computer microprocessors, And it exists for just one reason, and that's to ensure that you live the best life possible. And of course, that means also a life without problems. And problems are simply a sign that like any machine, you're using your brain machine the wrong way. Well, in this episode, I want to introduce you to a man who not only has proven in his own life how to achieve enormous success by using your brain the right way, He's also written a number of best-selling books which describe how to actually do this. And this man is Ken Roberts. And Ken Roberts was the creator in the 1990s of what was probably the world's best-selling courses on trading commodities. And through his programs, he taught more than 1 million people in 89 countries and built a company with more than 500 employees and hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. And he then went on to write what I consider, along with many others, to be one of the best books ever written on how to achieve real success. And that book was called A Rich Man's Secret, and it became a bestseller. And in the book, he relates how he accidentally discovered an astonishing old manuscript that soon turned his life into a rags to riches story. And he believes that the long hidden secret he discovered in this manuscript holds the key to his success. So without further ado, I'd really like to introduce you to a man who's going to share with us ideas on what are the real keys to success, and that's entrepreneur and author Ken Roberts. So welcome, Ken. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Liam. Thank you very much. Thanks for the kind words and what a nice, warm welcome. I appreciate it. Well, you know, it's funny, isn't it, when you write a book, well, you you would know, you, you never know where it actually goes and who it influences and you know, what, and how, how many people you might be helping. And, you know, I, I do this, I've written a few books myself, and, um, you know, you never quite know when you put it out there. But I'm, I'm certainly an example right. of somebody who read your book many years ago, and it did create a, a great impression on me. I, I still remember it to this day. And, 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 you know, what you put in there was just so full of wisdom and so much what I've come to realize is the truth that you can – you know, you can spend your life searching for the answers, but there's actually a very obvious place that we forget to look. So that's so, right. So I wonder if you wouldn't mind telling me. I, I I spoke briefly about who you are and what you do, but I think it'd be really interesting if you wouldn't mind sharing us a bit about your story and, in particular, how you really got into becoming firstly successful in in everything you did, and then how that led you on to 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 really write your books. Well, I was always a seeker, Liam. I I was born and raised in Southern California in the San Fernando Valley in Encino, actually, which is a very rich town. We were not rich, but that was a rich town. We actually lived right on the border of Encino and Reseda, which was the railroad tracks. So I grew up in this very ritzy, opulent, famous I mean, Johnny Carson, John Wayne, Jimmy Stewart, Liberace, Jack Webb, all the celebrities lived in Encino. And I went to Birmingham High School in Van Nuys, and it was a very rich high school. I mean, the student parking lot, I'm not kidding you. There was a Ferrari in there. There were Camaros and Firebirds and Thunderbirds. And one gal I had a crush on drove her dad's Rolls Royce to high school. I mean, it was like way over the top. And I had a 53 Chevy. So I parked it three blocks away 
and walked into school every day because I didn't want them to see I was from the poor side of the tracks. You know, so I had this thing. I had to get rich. I My thing was I needed to get rich because I didn't like being less than, you know, being less than everyone else. I wanted to fit in. And um, but what a rich upbringing. I mean, I was on the dating game twice and the newlywed game and the family feud. And if you saw American Graffiti, the classic movie, that was actually filmed three miles from my house. That was Van Nuys Boulevard that they were cruising up and down. That movie inspired Happy Days, the famous, famous TV series. And that's when and where and how I grew up. So it was just idyllic, really. I mean, it was perfect. But I was always in angst because I want, how do I get rich? How do I get rich? So all I knew, and I actually tried college, uh, four colleges, but I wouldn't last. I would just sit there looking at the stack of books on the seat next to me and going, I, I don't belong here. This is not for me even though I tried it four times. And, and then at that time was the Vietnam draft. This was about 1969 when I graduated high school and started going to these colleges. And um, I actually was gonna go, in, um, not, what is it, not enroll, enlist in the Air Force. And I went and took their tests and all of that. And anyway, that, that didn't, I mean, a friend of mine said, don't believe anything they tell you. <laughs> they will tell you anything you want to hear to get you to sign up. And then it will be nothing like you signed on for. So, but I wasn't a draft dodger or anything like that. And I got real lucky. My um, uh, lottery number, they drew lotteries then. And my birthday was number 364. So they never got to me. But I was struggling and I would try to work for different sales organizations. I just knew I could not work for someone else. That, that was deep in, that was embedded in me. I could not work for someone else, even though I tried. And I had to be on my own. Uh, and that's all I knew, Liam. And it, you know that caused a lot of angst and a lot of problems. But anyway, what happened was actually a blessing. And I, you know, not many of your listeners can relate, but some will. And what I, what I discovered is that I, I was an, I am an alcoholic, but I was an active alcoholic back then. And I discovered AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. And that is a very spiritual program. Now, I had been a serious spiritual student. I mean, I made a list the other day, and it's it was more than 20 very serious, um, well-respected spiritual programs. And I really gave it my all. But nothing was happening with them. I just, it just wasn't clicking with me until I found AA. Now, Maybe this is the time I, I put together a little uh, a page of notes here, and I can actually email it to you also. But if you'll uh, if you'll let me, I want to talk about all right this this quote by Henry David Thoreau: "The mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation." What is called resignation is confirmed desperation. All right, pretty, pretty sour pill, huh? <laughs> but you know it rings true. Don't you sense that that is true? The mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. And that's, what, that's why we seek. That's what we're seeking. And... I'll just sum it up and say it, and then we can talk all, all about it, if you want, you know, however much you want to talk about it. We are talking about spirituality. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. It's not the other way around. We're not humans trying to get a spiritual experience. 
we are spiritual beings and we're having a human experience. All right. Now, in describing this and trying to explain it, they're of two different natures. There's a spiritual and the physical, and they don't meet. So it's like trying to catch a beam of light in a butterfly net. You can't do it. They are of different natures. And that's where the conflict and the struggle occur because we sit down and I was doing, I'm talking about me, Liam. I was, I got to figure this out. How do I get rich? I got to have money. That was my solution. Others is I got to have fame. Okay. I got to have fame. I got to have fortune. I got to have friends. Well, you know, whatever it is, I got to have a family. I got to have a house, whatever it is to each individual. But with me, it was, I got to have money. Now I used to give big seminars, like 600 people. And I would start out and say, all right, let me kind of get a handle on who you are and where you're at. I said, I'm going to give you two choices. Would you rather be happy or would you rather be rich? And 97% of them, I want to be rich. I say, mm -hmm. well, I say, well, why do you want to be rich? Well, so I'll be happy. I said, but I just told you, you can go straight to happy. No, no, I want to be rich. Then I will be happy. And then I say, well, do you read People magazine? That's like lifestyles of the rich and miserable. Those people are rich, they're famous, and they're miserable. And they're finding their next soulmate of the week, you know? <laughs> so that's that's the human condition, Liam. We think we can figure this out. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to figure this out. Well, I'm not going to figure it out. This took me a long time to see this, by the way. I'm not going to figure it out because if I could figure it out, I would have been doing it already. It's not in my brain. Where, which would make me capable of figuring it out. It's not in my brain. The answer's not there. So where do I get it? I get it from without. Okay, now I'm going to say God, but you, Lo, in AA, people say higher power, whatever that, whatever their understanding of a higher power. But I don't care who you are. I don't care if you call yourself an atheist, an agnostic. I don't care. You have to know that there is an underlying force to this universe. That's indisputable. There is an underlying intelligence and force, non-physical, that underlies everything in this universe. I mean, we can go on and talk about that. But, I mean, all of this, there's intelligence behind it. And the other thing to think about is anything... Okay, we were created, right? I mean, you have to admit, we were created. Well, the creator has to be on a higher level than we are. You know, you and I can create all the little things we create, and we are on a higher level than those things that we create. Therefore, whoever or whatever created us has to be on a higher level. It's just logical. So that's where we start. Then the next step I learned, and all this took years, Liam. <laughs> this took a lot of years. I'm not just, it just, just didn't start clicking off like this. All right. In, deep in, in our AA big book, we call it, deep inside every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. Okay. We all have this inner urging in us. And it's to actually, it, to put it poetically, it's to go back home. It's to find God, okay? To have our connection, conscious contact with God. That's what drives us. That's why, and we look for it in all the wrong places, in money and relationships and sex, in fame. We look for it in all the wrong places. And then we find out, well, that's not God, because every one of those will turn on you and destroy you, you know, if you let it. All right. So we have this inner urging. And the way I've summed it up recently, 
rather recently is, what is your passion? What is it that just lights your fire? And your what ha, what lights your fire, Liam, is different than what lights my fire. And that passion is our first step. You take your first step toward that passion. All right, now I'll give, that's a big chunk to gnaw on, so I'll let you gnaw on that a little while. <laughs> You know, well, it's it's very interesting. You you um, explain it in a very similar, or well, maybe slightly different way to I I explain it. Where, you know, the way I see it is that on a because we we do have a physical dimension, as you say, and therefore there must be some laws that govern our physical existence. And if you look at all of nature, which is the best guide to because we're part of nature to, for clues. You know, all of nature exists to be the best it can be, to create more life and to survive and, and thrive. And, you know, you mentioned all of our uniqueness. And I think one of the things that um, I've become aware of, one way to explain this to people, because I think, well, that's a nice idea. I should follow my passion. OK, well, it's all very well for you. You know, but, but when you look at it, actually, on a scientific biological level, we have this blueprint within us, within every cell of our being, which is in our DNA, and that is an exact, unique blueprint for who we are. And by following our passion, what we're doing is we're express expressing the blueprint of who we really are. And, and our brain and our, that intelligence that you were referring to, that's all designed to support us to bring out this unique intelligence that we are. On a, and this is on a physical as well as every other level. So... It, it makes sense then, doesn't it, from that point of view, if you're here to be who you are and you've got a, a whole machinery that is, is going to make your life perfect, it's going to make everything that is best for you happen if you let it, and you can tap into an intelligence that knows how to make that all happen, then your whole purpose for being here is to, is to be unique and to follow your passion, yes. which, and the only way you can do that is literally stop listening to other people, listen to yourself and take the next step because the part of your brain exactly. and the part of you that knows what to do is not your thinking. You know, I was like you spending years reading all the books, going to the seminars, going to church, um, re you know, trying to figure all the stuff out, but that's not the part of your brain that, that is operating and is running your life. So that's right. It, it's right, isn't it? That's where, where passion comes in. And people say to me, oh, you know, it's all real for you to follow your passion. I don't know what I want. I don't know what my passion is. Well, well you don't need to worry about it. You let it come out. You know, your, your infinite right. intelligence knows. So give up the struggle. You know? Exactly. Yeah. All right. May I go into a kind of a paper? I want to share with you and your listeners this little paper I kind of drew up and it, I, I think it's fascinating. Great. So okay. could we go into that? Sure. Thanks. Okay. I want you. Okay. Do you, uh, we talk about the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Somehow we know that's true. Cause that, that is us or that was us. Okay. Is there uh, do, do you, are you familiar with a TV commercial that we have in America by Lending Tree, the mortgage lender. No, I'm I'm the last person to ask about okay. TV commercials. I'm sorry, I haven't watched TV in years. But okay, uh, yeah, I, but, I haven't um, watched in months. But it's a clever commercial, and people can look it up on YouTube. Lending Tree. Um, okay, now here's the gist of it. It's got an important lesson in it. It shows this man. He goes, hi, I'm Bob. And, he, you know, a nicely dressed man, middle class, you know. And he says, and this is my house. And they show this nice two-story house in a nice suburb. And it has a swimming pool. And he said, and this is my family. And he has a wife and a son and a daughter. And they're all standing there. And, you know, very nice looking family. And he says, and this is our brand new car. And, and now there are four of them are driving down the street in the car. And, and then the next one, it shows him on his ride-em lawnmower. You know, he's mowing his lawn, riding this little ride-em lawnmower. And he says, how do I do it? I'm up to my eyeballs in debt. 
He said, would someone help me, please? And that Liam is in a nutshell, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. That man is killing himself to keep up the pretense so that he looks and his family looks great to everyone else. But they, there's a, they see the writing on the wall, Liam. They're not going to be able to keep this up forever. And they see the, the futility of it. And that is the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. So what, what people do by the millions, and this is what I, I'll email this to you. They read The Purpose Driven Life by uh, Rick Warren. Are you familiar with that book? Yes, a little bit, yeah. The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. That, that has sold over 30 million copies, all right? Now, here is the first sentence in that book. It's not about you. That's the first sentence. So this is not a self-help book, Liam. And that's the biggest section of every bookstore is the self-help section, right? Mm. But success is not about self-help. It's about God help, okay, or higher power help. So the first sentence reads, it's not about you. And the remainder of the chapter goes on to explain how the quest for personal fulfillment and satisfaction and meaning can only be found in understanding and doing what God placed you on earth to do. All right. That's example number one. Example number two, that the, the, um, the pe that people gravitate towards, and they, this has also sold over 30 million copies. It's called The Road Less Traveled by Dr. M. Scott Peck. Are you familiar with that one? Yes, yep. Okay, so the first sentence in The Road Less Traveled is, life is difficult. This is a great truth, one of the greatest truths. And then an asterisk, it says it's the first of the four noble truths which Buddha taught was that life is suffering. It is a great truth because once we truly see this truth, we transcend it. And then it says discipline is the basic set of tools we require to solve life's problems. Without discipline, we can solve nothing. All right. 30 million copies each of those two books. And you know what else? You know what book has sold 40 million copies? Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's why I will say I am a grateful alcoholic. The reason I say that is because that is what put me on the right path. And I would probably still be out there uh, leading a life of quiet desperation. I may have never made it to the path, but it took alcoholism to do it. And all I had to do was give up pouring booze down my throat. <laughs> so what was it that made the shift for you then? What, what did you learn? Or What it is, what it is, Liam, and this is why it's, it's so elusive for normies. I'm going to call them normies, non-alcoholics, okay? I had to admit, I mean, not just by saying the words, I had to know in my heart, I was powerless over alcohol. It whipped me. It beat me. I was in an inner hell. And I had to say, I, God, I can't do this. I cannot do this. I need help. And when you admit powerlessness, that is the strength when God can come and work through you, whether you're a normie or an alcoholic. Admitting powerlessness, it's a paradox. But when you admit and know that you are powerless, that's when God can come in. Your higher power can work through you. But unfortunately, most normies 
are able to hold it together. They hold it together and keep struggling and keep borrowing and keep working and keep thinking, what do I do next? I got to come up with the next invention to make a million dollars, or I'm going to write the next bestseller, or I'm going to be, you know, be on America's Got Talent and win the deal. And they keep struggling, trying to figure this thing out. And they'll go to the grave with the song still in them. Whereas if you are brought to your knees and you, you, are, you know you are powerless, that's when all the magic can begin. Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, I know for my own life as well, and I, I talk about um, you know, the fact that in my mid-40s, after having been a student of success all my life and, and turning it into a lot of success, then suddenly losing everything and becoming homeless and moving in with my elderly mother, you know, it's, it's in those moments that, on the, that the things you're most afraid of, really, which is having to let go and give up and realize you're at the bottom and you don't know what to do, that's when what you actually do, and this is the at the core of what I'm really teaching um, the, now, is that's when you shift your brain, if you, if you, another way of explaining it, into a different space where your yeah. this whole thinking, trying to figure it out, that limited part of your brain is no longer in control, and the real part of your creative brain, I call it your natural creative state, that's when that takes over, and you suddenly start to live your life, and this is why I was interested in and your take on this was you suddenly start to live your life where you actually just let go and trust. And you, that's when you do just take the next step because you know that everything's going to turn out. And what's there to be afraid of? Because I think what you're alluding to that what drives most people underneath it is fear. They're afraid they won't right. have enough money. They won't have be loved. They'll be, they'll, they'll won't be successful. And of course, you know, our, our um, capitalist society tends to really, fuel this um this desire does, for more yeah. um but it's all based on a fear whereas and i teach something called neurostate rebalancing which is about using your brain a different way which is really to get rid of your fear so you can suddenly let you can suddenly get in the flow of life and when you're in the flow of life what do you do you enjoy every moment you trust the next step is going to be perfect and you allow the miracles to show up so right. it's very much what you're saying, I think, isn't it? About you reach a point where yeah, and this that, whole thinking that thing. shift. Yeah, the shift cannot happen unless somewhere in you, you realize I'm powerless. I can't do this. I need help. And then that shift is when all the magic can happen. And you're not self-managing anymore. Exactly. Well, you actually are managing, but you're managing from a place where that it's not the same place as trying to think and figure things out and be being trying That's to work right. it all out all the time. Because I, I use the analogy in your brain, if you try and figure things out, then all, the only knowledge that you're tapping into is anything that you've already learned. You can exactly, only and you that. don't know. Yeah. No, but if you're you can allow... You're tapping into this thing that doesn't have the answer. <laughs> It's a bit like going into a library looking for a book and, and then where the answer is and then saying, well, the book isn't here. Then what do you do? And even if That's it right. is there, you don't know if it's the whole truth. But if you can tap into the infinite amount of information, which is what your right. body and, and, and your whole being is doing every moment anyway, it's creating something yes. even thinking about it, um, then that's yeah. the way you want to live. You know? And of course, it says in the Bible, um, have faith. Let go, trust, believe, you know, and everyone right. unfortunately signs up to religions, but they don't do that. And they're busy trying to make things happen no. and read the next book and, you know, take out another mortgage and to try and be happy. It, exactly. Yep. Will someone help me, please? That's he's got to get to that point. You know, there's a, a wonderful movie called War Games, War Games from the 80s. And it builds up to this climax. It's very dramatic. And the, these computers are analyzing what's going on. It's about the end of the world. You know, what's going to happen if Russia sends the bomb over here and we send it back and this and that. And it's playing this game. It's playing it forward. What's going to happen? <clears throat> and it finally, then everything shuts down and it gets quiet. And it says, this game cannot be won. 
the only logical solution is to not play. <laughs> and we have, that's what we have to do. And it takes work. It takes effort to not buy in to what my brain is telling me I need to do next to be successful and to be happy. Yeah, well, of course, society has, has really created a game with rules that we can never win. So you know, yeah. what's, the, what's the point of playing a game that you can't win? That's the rules are that, you know, you, so I think we need to unlearn a lot of the, uh, the conditioning we've been given, which of oh, course absolutely. has been really yes, motivated absolutely. by yeah, the hamster, yeah. the hamster on the wheel. That's what we are. Yeah. And of course, you know, you can understand if you're um, a corporation or a, uh, somebody who wants to exert power or over somebody else or to get some money out of somebody else, the best way to do that is to make people feel bad and that they need something else to make them feel good, particularly your, what you're selling. So um, yeah, yeah, that's there's a lot of yeah. conditioning to overcome. And that's why I'm doing this podcast is really to, to help people understand, to, to decondition from what really society is, has given us from birth, which is you're not perfect. You don't have all the answers. You can't be happy unless you really struggle and try hard and try and figure everything out. And you never will be anyway. And you need more than you've already got for you to be happy. You know, that's all the right. conditioning we're taught from birth. So, and, and, and I think, as you're right, that's what keeps most people in quiet desperation. Yes. So, yeah. So the logical question, this is the first sentence in, in this book I wrote. Everyone's logical question is, and they may be asking themselves as they're listening to this now, so what do I do now? Right? That's the logical question. And the answer is, it, what I've come up with after years, is go inside yourself and what is it that just lights your fire? What is your passion? And I don't care what it is, Liam. I don't care if it's flying Frisbees or making origami. It doesn't matter. And, and then our brain will kick in and say, well, that's just so childish. That would be crazy to want to, want to excel at the hula hoop. You know, I don't care if that's what comes to your mind and that's what gets your juices flowing. Let's focus on the hula hoop. All right. Now. What is what can you do right now to take one step forward, one step toward excelling at that hula hoop? And then some idea will come to them. That's their first step. Do it. And then the next will be revealed. You don't know where it's going to go, but it the next will be revealed. You know, I think that was and great. that's how I've come to it. I think you described it really well um, on something I read of yours saying uh, goals and plans are actually self-sabotage. Yes, that's uh, that's from the, this is the best book I ever wrote, The Ultimate Technique for Success. And the bottom line, like you already said it, is fear. And there are, four, there are 40, I call them dream tickets in here. There's 40 exercises to do that will get you going through fear because fear is just an illusion it's just a bluff but people die under this illusion and these exercises will get you going through those uh those false barriers you know what is it false evidence appearing real that's what fear is false evidence appearing real well, before we finish, we must get your details and where we can get get the book from. Um, so we'll we'll come to that. But it's interesting you mention fear because the way I way I've learned to um, to understand fear is on a on a physical chemical level. Um, what happens when you feel afraid is your brain literally shuts down all of the creative, intuitive, imaginative part right. which is because it's focused on getting you out of an immediate danger and if you're faced with survive um, right. so if you're faced with a threat right there and then your brain has to stop you from a seeing all of the different possibilities and coming up with strategies and creative solutions it's got to get you just reacting and the other thing it has to your brain does is it automatically shuts out anything that's not negative because your brain is looking right. for the problems it's looking for the danger it's looking for all the threats so that's why fear is the enemy, because when you feel fear, 
you've shut out all your awareness of what's really going on in the world or what's going on around you. And you also block your ability to actually come up with a creative solution to what you're facing. Yes. So, um, yeah. you know, but, but people are running around in fear and they think, you know, if I can fix this problem, then I'll, I won't feel fear, but it's, right. <laughs> it's the wrong way around. That's isn't right. it? Yeah. So, yeah. And let me bring up an example that people bring up a lot. And this has helped me through the years. They'll say, Oh yeah, well, if you were in a cabin and a bear, a bear, uh, you know, broke through the door, that's fear. And you know what? It's not. If you think about it, you're in this cabin in the mountains. This bear comes crashing through the door. You're gonna fly through that window as fast as you can, right? That's not fear. That's instinct. The fear doesn't kick in until you outside you're catching your breath and you start thinking about what just happened that's when all the fear comes flooding in so that instinct is not fear <laughs> i always found that fascinating yeah and of course most people are afraid of things that aren't actually real anyway aren't they so right. they're, they're right. subconscious fears that people have that stop them from you know it's keep it right. keeps the man trying to borrow more money to to get a better house because he's afraid of his or his subconscious is telling him oh you need more otherwise you might lose everything and so most That's of the right. time You'll start. Yeah. yeah so most of the time we're driven by fears that aren't even real so the trick is to right. figure out why is my brain telling me what's it saying that i'm afraid of and once you can understand that you can actually get rid of that fear and of course, one of the ways to do it, which you obviously experienced as well, is the fear of not having anything. The best way to do that is to end up where you have nothing. And then um, yeah. your brain goes, well, this isn't, isn't actually so bad. So why have you been afraid of this? You're still here. And then you can actually, well, uh, uh, you know, without a that spiritual fear. teacher, a spiritual teacher, Dr. David R. Hawkins. Are you familiar yes, with him? Read his books, Power Versus oh, I, Force. I, I went for three years every other month he would give a workshop in Sedona, Arizona. And every other month for three years, I went there and the man was incredible. And he had what he called the so what exercise. Okay, like you were just talking. Okay, you say, oh God, I'm so afraid I'll lose my job. Well, so what? Well, then I won't have any money. Well, so what? Well, then I'll lose my house. So what? Well, then I'll lose my family. They'll be scattered to the winds. So what? Well, then I'll li I'll have to go live under a bridge. Well, so what? Well, then I'll die under the bridge. Well, so what? And that's what it always boils down to is you're going to die. And he would explain that as the ego does not want to die. It does not want to not exist. And that's what's driving the ego. It's irrational. It's, in, it's insane. <laughs> but that's what the ego drives us to do. Yeah, and unfortunately, when we live in a fear state and our, we're blocked from accessing our wider awareness, we can't see that because when we actually lose those fears, we realize what death actually is. And I mean, I'm, you're probably familiar too with the many, many cases of, of documented cases of near death experiences, where in every single case, people who've died and come back, they've, they've said to the doctor, Why did you bring me back? It was so right, much better right. over there. I, I, it was my, I didn't want to come back. Yeah. And, you know, all religion teaches us there's a paradise out there beyond this life. And yet we're told everywhere there's nothing to be afraid of, yet people still are. And it's this irrational right. lack of awareness that you can't see all of that when you're in a fear state. Right. And uh, yeah. the doc used to start every single workshop, every single workshop. He would say, if you hear nothing else today, it was an all day workshop. If you hear nothing else today, I want you to know it is safe to die. It is safe to die because that's our bottom line fear we don't want to die and he would say if nothing else just remember that <laughs> yeah 
No, it's so true. Of course, people remembering it and actually uh, believing it are, are two different things. But, yeah, that's two different things, right? Yeah. So I'm just mindful of the time here. Um, and I was going to ask you, what do you think? You know, you've been very successful. You are very successful in, in your life and you've done a lot of things. And particularly having, I haven't read your second book, but I very much, I'm going to read it, but um, the, certainly the first book is about, you know, what your path to success was and what you understood, how to get, how to get into this space. Um, and we've talked a little bit about, you know, what most people's problems are, but what do you think is the real block, the biggest block that people have in becoming successful? You know, in, in other words, why are so many people frustrated and, can't figure it out and you've been there in your life as well trying to figure it all out right. work it all out but what's right. the it, right. is there a way to sum up the difference between that and then actually figuring it out and things going in the right direction i'll tell you it all it all was summarized <clears throat> in this i i did not know where to go but i knew i needed to get somewhere i felt this inner urging all right so I knew I liked to write. I liked to write instructions for people. I just, weird, right? But I like to write instructions to people. All right, so I started focusing on that. Well, what, what can I write instruction? What can I explain? About that time, my wife said, there was this big full page ad in the newspaper. And it said, free foreclosure seminar. Well, foreclosures was a hot topic in Southern California back in the 70s. And she said, why don't you go? And he, you know, it's supposed to teach you how to get rich buying foreclosures. So I went, I went and I loved it. It was one of those free previews, you know, where they're trying to sell you on the $195 weekend seminar. But I just loved it. And what got me though, so anyway, I borrowed the money, Liam, and I went and I loved it. And I saw what was going on. The trick to that was to, you had to knock on doors of foreclosure victims. Well, that's very fearful, don't, right? I mean, go knock on these desperate people's doors and say, I'll buy your house and all that. Well, anyway, I did it. I was so desperate. I did it. I knocked on 15 doors a day. I plotted it out and drove to all those places and knocked on the doors. And it was horrible. But here's what happened. The man who put on the seminar, Char Charles Shubin was his name. And he helped me buy two or three foreclosures. He would go partners. I'd bring him the deal. He was very, very helpful to me. And by the way, he was in Alcoholics Anonymous. I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, what I all these people would call him back and say, this isn't working for me. I want my money back. This isn't working for me. And he'd say, well, call Kenny Roberts. Talk to him. And so I would let him call me and I would say, you got you know, you just have to go through this and da 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 da. And that's when the light bulb went off. I can write a little book explaining to them how I do this and how this does work if you do it. And that was my very first uh, set of instructions for people. So I have this sense of what do people want and how can I give it to them and explain it to them? And that's my knack. And then, you know, a long and winding road. But all of a sudden, I end up in the commodity world. I didn't know what a commodity was. And then this California deputy sheriff I just happened to run into started showing me. And I said, this is incredible. I said, this is what all those people in real estate are looking for, they just don't know it because they don't know what the commodity world is like. And that's what started that book, The World's Most Powerful Money Manual. And like you read at the beginning, I had over a million customers in 89 countries around the world. 
nothing was ever bigger before and it's never been bigger since. It was unbelievable, Liam. And I could have never thought it up. I just took the first step and the next was revealed and the next was revealed. And it just, it, it pulled me into it. And that's why I say no goals. I could have never dreamt this thing up. Liam, I had two jets. We would fly all over the world doing seminars. I would have never put that on a goal list. <laughs> no, exactly. Never. Yeah. Yeah. So if the answer's not in your head, how could a goal be in your head? You, a goal to what? You don't even know what. So it's insane, really. It's arrogant. <laughs> yes. Well, it, it's, it's really, unfortunately, I think it's just a lack of understanding about who we really are. Yeah more than anything, isn't it? And that's what I'm right. trying to do in this show and in my, in my coaching is to help people understand who that, more of who they are. Because, you know, I think that thing about just taking the first step, once you start doing it, um, it, it actually becomes easy in a way, doesn't it? And it's like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Why, did it's I struggle? Fun. why did I struggle before? And you start to see all sorts of synchronicities and un unusual th and co coincidences and miracles and weird things show up and you realize that it's not your trying to figure it out brain and control that's making it all happen but there's, there's something else that's that's at work so then you go okay well i'm just going to trust and, and uh, take that next step so but would you also agree that getting over that hump you've, you've got to have an experience of that and getting to that point where you really do let go and you just say, I'm not going to think about anything else about allowing the next step to show up. And it could be, as you've said, somebody saying to you, look at that, or, you know, your wife saying, right, right. You, or you go to something and you have no expectation about it, but you just, and you don't even know why you go, you're suddenly there and it takes your life yeah. in the next direction. So right. what, what is it you think about how people could, if they are struggling to, you know, and when they're when they're listening to this and they're going, well, that's all very well for Liam and Ken, you know, talk about all this, but I can't let go. Um, how can people? What's what's something you could say to people? Do you think that's a way to help people go? Just get a little bit of an experience of this. So just dip their toe just, into just, the. I would say, what is it that lights your fire? What do you get turned on about? And I don't care if the answer is model railroading. It doesn't matter what the, it's what turns you on. <clears throat> and that's the nugget you start from. And then you say, okay, I love this. I love model railroading. Okay, what's what step can I take in this direction to do what? You know, I want to build a model railroad set. I want to teach people about model railroad. I don't know what their passion is, but what is it about this model railroad? What step could you take? Well, I could go downtown to the model railroad shop. Okay, do it. Take the first step. Now go to the model railroad shop and some your next step's going to be revealed there. Yeah, so don't even think That's about how what it works. The, don't even think about what the no. next step might be. Yeah. No, because you don't know. It's not in your brain, so you can't know what the next step is. See what shows up. Yeah, I think that's great. A great way of, and of course, that's what the your book, A Rich Man's Secret, is all about. It's such a enjoyable book to read because you've done it in such an, a, a sort of an adventure story way. And when you really think about it, that's what our life should be is an adventure. You know, most people make it a, a trial, right. but if you do right. just if take the next step, and and I loved reading the book for you know for, for that it really was combining an adventure story, a really great story with so much truth, um, and just to think, well. It's so sad if people, if we forget that life is an adventure, you know, we're here to have fun. Right. And that's what we're here for. We're not here to right, struggle. Right. So, um, yeah, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'll ask you just before we finish, but um, I think, you know, Rich Man's Secret, if people haven't read it, it's, it's, it's really, I was very, uh, I think it's a great book. Well, thank you, Liam. Well, they can, let me tell them how to find me. Yes, and please. all they do is. Details. Yeah, go to KenRoberts.com, KenRoberts.com, and then sign up for my free private email list, 
they'll see the the medallion the badge on there and then it's got my uh how to get my two books the uh, rich man's secret novel and the ultimate technique for success and there's phone you you cannot order it off the website but you call though either of those two phone numbers that's in oregon that office is in oregon and they'll take your order and send them out priority mail to you and they do they ship outside the u.s as well yes and it's uh, kenroberts.com kenroberts.com okay well that's brilliant okay well hey it's been fantastic talking to you ken and um as i say it's been a bit of a I don't know quite. I, I guess I just took the first step and contacted you and thought, would you be open to yeah, having... you see, you did it. That's right. That's right. I fired an answer right back, right? You did. You <laughs> did. Yeah. So I really appreciate it. This was it. all what? What was this arranged on? What day was that? Uh, it was only yesterday, wasn't it? Sunday? Yeah. And today's Monday. So that's how that happens. I think you said, <laughs> said you name a day. And I thought, what's the next step? Well, what's wrong with tomorrow? Make it the yeah. first day. And yeah. You don't, and it worked beautifully. Yeah, yeah. Well, can I say to everybody, uh, thank you very much, Ken, again, for um, sharing your wisdom and experience with us. And I think for me, and hopefully for you as a listener, you know, hearing from somebody who's actually been there and done that and can tell you that you don't need to... I, I, I just want to quote what he also says, just in, in leaving, because I think this was is very important. What Ken says, it's nothing to do with religion, positive thinking, counseling, rebirthing, meditating, visualization, concentration, therapy, reprogramming your subconscious mind, hypnosis, or anything weird or way out. It's as practical as can be, but no one has ever explained it before. And I hope that you've really picked up from Ken what I've been trying to share with you as well on these podcasts is that, you know, we're not, life is not designed to be hard. And really, if we have a bit of faith and trust and understanding of how our brain works and of who we really are, then all we need to do is enjoy the next step and it'll, and the next one will show up after that. And uh, it's a pity it's not more complicated in some ways, isn't it, Ken? But uh, that's the reality that's, that's of it, right. yeah. how we're designed to be. Everything great is simple, you know? Mm. Yeah. So thank you so much for uh, being a guest on using your brain for success. Well, thank you for inviting me, Liam. This has been a real treat. Thank you. That's all for this episode of Using Your Brain for Success. Thanks for listening, and a very special thanks to our guest, Ken Roberts. And I look forward to sharing with you in future episodes so much more about who you really are and the incredible power of your brain. And if you'd like to learn more about how to use your brain the right way, visit my website, liamnaden.com. There you'll find information about my coaching services and the ways I can help you achieve your full potential. And you can also learn about neurostate rebalancing. This is a powerful process that automatically gets your brain working the right way so that you live the inspired and fulfilling life that you're truly designed to live. I look forward to connecting with you again soon. Bye for now.